<laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Very, very excited to be here. I want to uh, thank Mr. Daniel Lai uh, for that, uh, that welcome. And I want to add my welcome to all of you who have uh, come to join us for the OpenStack Summit here in Hong Kong. We are thrilled to be here. This is our first OpenStack Summit that we've held outside of the United States. And it's, uh, it's um, looking to be an excellent one. We are going to have over 3,000 people here this week from 50 countries and 480 cities. So every summit that we've had has been an international summit and uh, has had participants from dozens of countries. But this one by far um, tops them all in terms of the representation that we have from communities all across the world. And, uh, and that's really, I think, um, such a great thing for OpenStack and really for, for the industry overall. Um, one of the questions that I love to ask is, how many of you are here for the first time? Put your hand up if this is your first OpenStack Summit. Wow. I mean, that is a, a, a very large percentage of you. I think based off of the registration information, somewhere around 2 thirds of you are here at your first OpenStack Summit. And, uh, and that is a, a, a great thing for our community to be able to have new participants, new developers, new users come in and, and participate in this. A couple of housekeeping items. Your badge that uh, you got at registration has a lot of useful information. Things like uh, the Wi-Fi access information. OpenStack.org slash summit has uh, information concerning where the different session locations are. There will be content in this room all day today and tomorrow. And then as you head back um, towards the entrance of the Asia World Expo, there are breakout rooms that, uh, that have sessions in them. And upstairs is where the technical sessions for the, uh, the active technical contributors will be taking place. The badge also contains information about the evening events. And, uh, and there are always a lot of evening events um, in addition to these that take place at the OpenStack summits. Great time to, uh, to mix and mingle and meet up with, uh, with other members of the community. Um, in addition to, uh, to the content that we're going to have in this room and in the breakout sessions, we are going to be having design summit sessions here to plan out the next release of OpenStack. And if this is your first design summit, please try to attend the Design Summit 101 session that takes place at 11.15. It's immediately after we finish the keynotes this morning. It's very important to, uh, to attend that and understand how the Design Summit process works so those sessions can be very productive and efficient through the uh, remainder of the week. And there are also um, some OpenStack 101 sessions happening at that same time if you're trying to, uh, to, to sort of get your teeth cut on OpenStack and, and understand exactly what this is all about. These events take a lot of effort from a lot of people and a lot of resources as well. And I want to thank our headline sponsors who uh, provide a large portion of the funding that allows us to be able to, to put these events on. HP, Canonical, Red Hat, IBM are all companies who have who been big supporters of OpenStack and, uh, and are the headline sponsors at this summit. And you'll get an opportunity to hear from each of these uh, companies over the next two mornings of, of keynotes. And then we, we had a new program this time around that I wanted to call out as well. We, uh, we implemented a travel scholarship program to help uh, attendees who might not otherwise be able to come to the summit because of, uh, of the cost of, of traveling um, be able to make it here. And Intel graciously sponsored this and supported our efforts and allowed us to be able to bring a number of, uh, of, of developers and community contributors um, from, from all over the world here to Hong Kong so they can participate in, in these important sessions. So we're thrilled to be here in Hong Kong. But you know, in OpenStack, we're always looking forward. And uh, I'm not going to hold you guys in suspense about where we're going to be for our next summit. I'm going to go ahead and get that out of the way. I kept it to the end last time. But we're just going to go ahead and, and, and put this up here. So May of 2014, we'll be back in the US in Atlanta. So I, I'm, I'm glad I heard some applause for that. <laughs> I know Atlanta, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe not as exciting as Hong Kong, but it's a great city. And, uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to make it even greater while we're there in, in May of, of 2014. But that's not all. I'm also going to tell you where we're going to be a year from now, which may be more exciting.
So one year from now, in November of 2014, we will once again be taking the OpenStack Summit on the road, and we will be in, uh, in the beautiful city of Paris, France. And hopefully we will, uh, we will be able to see many of you there, and also um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of new faces. Um, so as we saw, many of you are new, and that's, that's really fantastic. You know, this is the best place in the world to be if you want to get immersed in OpenStack and you want to learn about the software and the community. But just to sort of, at a very high level, um, just kind of level set a little bit. You know, OpenStack is software that's developed by an open source community and used to build clouds for service providers and enterprises all around the world. And it's, uh, it's very powerful software that's been developed by over 1,600 individual contributors and uh, over the past three years. And we're going to hear from dozens of users this week who are using this software for a variety of workloads. At a very high level, it's made of, of uh, different components to manage pools of resources, whether that's compute, storage, networking. And uh, it ties them all together and provides a set of APIs and management tools so that you can manage those, uh, those resources in an automated way as efficiently as possible, tie them into other systems, um, build new tools on top of them, make it all more valuable. And, uh, and that, in a nutshell, is, is what OpenStack is. As I mentioned, there's, um, there are OpenStack 101 sessions that are happening at 11.15, and, uh, and, and there are sessions throughout the week that will dive into all of the details of, of the different components of OpenStack um, so, you know, look at your badge, go to the schedule, and, uh, and find the, uh, the content that's, uh, that's going to be most useful for you so you can really dig into this. Um, as I mentioned, OpenStack is, is built by a global community. And in that community, we've seen phenomenal growth. We have an extremely large and uh, diverse set of contributors who, uh, who help build the software. But really, you know, this, this, um, this mission that we're on it's not just about building technology for technology's sake. You know, this isn't a science project. It's about making a difference in businesses and organizations all over the world by providing them with software that, uh, that can really have an impact for what they're trying to do. And in the technology industry, we've seen a few major shifts that have had incredible impact on, on our businesses and on our lives. And OpenStack, we're starting to see it have an impact at many levels in business, in the IT industry at large, in the way that software is developed. One of the things that, uh, that I hope you can learn about is, is the process for how OpenStack software gets developed. This community has developed tools and a process that, uh, that has scaled very rapidly and has provided um, an amazing capacity to, to add new contributors, new members, new features, and maintain a high level of, of, uh, of testing and stability. And, and to me, it's one of, the, one of the most exciting outputs of OpenStack. And so OpenStack is having an impact in a lot of different ways. In Portland, six months ago, at our last OpenStack Summit, we had some really great users who came and talked about what they were doing with, with OpenStack. And we had some, uh, some, some very large brands in, in the US, like Best Buy and Comcast and Bloomberg, that, uh, that came and talked about their usage of OpenStack. And we're very fortunate to have um, some more individuals who have come here today. And they're going to share their stories about what they're doing with OpenStack. And the thing that, uh, that I love is in every case, for all three of these, uh, these users that we're going to talk to, we have an individual here who is a leader in their organization. And they are taking OpenStack, and they're implementing it in their organization to have a positive impact on their business. So let's go ahead and, uh, and get started with our, our spotlights this morning. Shutterstock is a, is a company that, uh, that if, if you work in the creative industry, you're probably familiar with it. And, uh, and, and I'm very excited to have the VP of Technology Operations at Shutterstock here to talk with us today. So please help me welcome Chris Fisher. Morning, everybody. <laughs> so a quick show of hands, how many folks in the audience are familiar with what Shutterstock does and what the business is? Great, so a fair amount of you. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Shutterstock is a marketplace where um, photographers, videographers can upload their content, and we provide an opportunity for them to be able to sell that content 
uh, to a broader market segment, people who are, you know, need stock artwork for creating Christmas cards or a PowerPoint presentation, um, or doing something like creating a catalog. Um, before we kind of get into that a lot, uh, I want to talk a bit about what OpenStack is doing for our business. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of a brief background in myself, uh, as well as Shutterstock's uh, founding beginnings. So uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been building uh, scalable systems for about 10 years, uh, as well as the teams that are responsible with managing those systems. Um, from the get-go, I've always been someone that's been really interested in high levels of automation uh, and being able to build uh, a very strong operational organization uh, that can add business impact, not just you know, manage your environment. Um, I'm a huge, huge open source enthusiast. Uh, I mean, there are very few times that you can get me to buy a black box solution unless it's really, really exceptional. And that comes from a real belief that you know, if things really get tough, uh, you can control your own fate, get into the source code, figure out what's going wrong, uh, and, and really solve your own problems. Um, one other key point is that I, I have a pretty deep uh, systems and network engineering background. Uh, I'm an ops guy by trade. The only language that I've coded effectively in is you know, C, which is pretty much irrelevant you know, in, in a modern web company. Um, but I'm going to talk a lot about building uh, the type of stack that your developers want to interact with. Uh, I really believe in it. It's, it's done great things at other companies I've been at and at Shutterstock. Uh, and effectively, I think that's one of the key cornerstones of why OpenStack is something that's super effective for us. Uh, as a quick aside, I now spend most of my time, it seems like, uh, learning how to use Excel and PowerPoint uh, and try and explain to the rest of the executives and you know, people out in the industry you know, why these cloud systems are so important and so efficient. Um, so a little bit on uh, Shutterstock's founding beginnings. Um, we were founded in 2003 uh, by our CEO, John Oranger. Uh, he was our first developer, uh, which from the beginning really created a dev-centric organization. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's from inception to our IPO last October and beyond, we've remained very focused on creating a great, great technology platform that developers really like interacting with. Um, our tech stack, as another kind of note, predates the modern cloud. AWS was launched in 2006, maybe, I believe. Uh, and effectively, a lot of the modern technologies for building a cloud or interacting with the cloud just weren't there when we were already handling pretty large volumes of traffic. So a lot of the needs that we have are solved by OpenStack that provide us an environment that we can create a super usable cloud for developers, but at the same point help us uh, alleviate certain constraints that come from having an application that's uh, been around since pre-cloud days. So uh, inside our organization, we have kind of this developer ethos. Uh, and this isn't it. I, I wish it was this simple. Um, but if you read through that document, you'll find that there are a couple of key themes that just happen over and over again. Um, one, we build things that are core to our business. Uh, a lot of organizations really focus on the product, and I think that's fantastic. Uh, but we really ask ourselves, if this functionality is core to our business, uh, orchestration or deployment, or the ability to speed development, we want to be building that. We don't want to buy an, an off-the-shelf solution. Uh, secondly, we want to stay open source. I again, I kind of talked a little bit about you know, when things get rough, it's nice to be able to read the source code. But beyond that, it, it, there are great recruiting efforts and, and great capabilities that come out of using community-supported software. Um, it, it's just something I believe so much in, and it's treated us really, really well at Shutterstock so far. Um, Three, we want to invest in things that create collaboration uh, and innovation among all the individuals at our organization. Um, people don't talk a lot about how much tooling or your platform is important in that. Uh, it's really easy to think about process or being agile or having you know, Kanban-style type groups uh, to really help foster collaboration and innovation. But if you get inside a lot of developers' heads, they, you know, they think about collaboration and innovation via pull requests or working within a technology framework, uh, everyone being able to write and read code. And this is another one of the key points why you know, OpenStack is pretty great for our environment. Uh, and fourth, I think there's a lot of people out here who probably agree with this, just automate everything. If it's something you don't need a human to do it, uh, don't. You'll find something better for that human to be doing you know, other than you know, sitting there and running scripts recurrently at midnight every night. 
So uh, a little uh, bit about the platform. Uh, it seems pretty easy to upload and download photos and videos, but it is a pretty large system that we've created at Shutterstock. Uh, it's got thousands of nodes across multiple data centers. Uh, we're managing several petabytes worth of storage in an open source technology called MogulFS, um, which is backed by all kinds of heterogeneous disk from you know, white box servers to you know, appliances that we buy from a, a company called CoRaid using ATA over Ethernet. Um, we also collect over a terabyte uh, of logs uh, every single day. Uh, that's about 70 times the volume that the Hubble telescope downloads uh, to Earth. I realize it was put in space 15 years ago and it's in geosynchronous orbit, but still I like that stat, or that stat a lot. Um, and on the op side, as well as the dev side, we remain being pretty language agnostic. Um, we code in multiple different languages. Uh, the key takeaway from our you know, application stack is we really try to go fast. We're pushing code you know, hundreds of times a week, and we needed uh, the type of platform that was going to allow us to do this and get lots of dev interaction. So a couple of challenges. We were trying to work with uh, creating a, an environment that worked in low latencies. Uh, AWS, you can have pretty high latency between nodes. Um, OpenStack, being able to create a cloud environment where things are sitting right next to each other, uh, we could kind of conquer a lot of our network latency problems. Uh, we also wanted to create an environment where the culture uh, and the workflow of both operations teams and dev teams really was identical. Read the code, you know, the documentation is the code, uh, and, and interact with each other in a way that developers really understand. Uh, the goals, of course, are the same as many of you guys have. Have it be resilient. Um, and, and the other ones that we care about is keep it dev-centric, create an API-driven platform, uh, and work as much as you can with being open source. So this is where everyone's kind of screams like, DevOps, oh, DevOps is the way to do this. And, and I disagree. Uh, I think DevOps is a great idea. But when you have a singular DevOps team, you've just moved responsibility to another group of people that can also write some code. What we really want is a platform that creates a culture and a workflow where everybody effectively plays that role of DevOps. We want our developers, as well as our operations folks, writing code, sharing code, sharing knowledge, uh, whether it's application or the actual infrastructure platform. So um, you know, ultimately, what these things kind of create for your business is an environment where you have a super, super strong staff. Everyone can contribute back to the org. Everyone can write applications. Uh, everyone is able to triage the same, communicate the same. Um, we go crazy collecting metadata from all of these instances to look at uh, efficiencies and resource planning within the groups. Um, and, and it's a really powerful system when you can get everyone really working with the same platform, application side and dev side. So you know, that's effectively, you know, on this slide, when we really looked at what platform was going to help us do this the most successfully, um, we went the route of OpenStack. Uh, it has great community support. We have the ability to get in the code and get dirty. Uh, everyone's building against an API as opposed to looking at using config management systems like Puppet and Chef that may be a part of your environment. But uh, you know, building against an API is something that developers are going to embrace a lot more. Um, everyone can read the code. Uh, and, and effectively, uh, it encourages both ephemeral use and things that don't have persistent data, as well as allowing you to integrate uh, with systems that do have persistent data. So if, uh, thanks. If everyone has any quick questions for me, you can tweet stuff at me or send me an email. It's just chris at shutterstock.com. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, so don't leave yet. <laughs> uh, so I, when we've talked, one of the things that I found really interesting is you know, you're obviously a technologist, and you were throwing out some great stats about the, uh, the kind of environment you're running. But the thing that, uh, that really hit me when, when we talked before was, uh, was you have a business need, which is you have uh, this application that has specific requirements that maybe don't fit into a menu-driven type technology offering, but you have developers who are you know, developers, <laughs> and, and they want to have an agile environment to work in. And, uh, and so how does OpenStack kind of allow you to, to meet both of those needs in your business? A absolutely. So um, one of the key points that's made OpenStack so successful for us is that at first we thought we could solve this with just config management. We laid down a big puppet tree um, and tried to teach all the developers how to work with a DSL or you know, write scripts to interact with controlling their environment. 
And uh, it had some good success, but really, they kind of hated it. They're like, I just want an API to do this thing. Um, and so effectively, as we've been transitioning our provisioning systems over to using OpenStack, we're able to get everyone to really be excited about, I can just write code uh, that's going to call uh, the OpenStack's API, interact with it, provision my VMs, do all this work that before they had to do in a language that was a little foreign to them and didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and at the same time, we keep our ops team very happy in that we know a lot about what the metal's doing. It's not completely abstracted into a way that we feel we're losing control. Uh, and so it's really helped bring those groups together in just a yeah. common language via being API driven. So it lets you keep your application happy, your ops team happy, and your dev team happy. Correct. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks. So Shutterstock is, uh, is, is focused on. Um, the, the needs of, of creative types, and, uh, and including individual creatives. The, uh, the next user we're going to bring up is, uh, is a company called Digital Film Tree. And, uh, and this is a, a move from, from individual creatives to big budget media. And this is uh, going to be an exciting session um, that, uh, that we're going to have brought to us by the CTO of Digital Film Tree, Guillaume Obishan. So I know it's an odd place to start, but I want to talk about faith for a second. And I want to talk about faith because we have an issue in our industry right now. And that fact is that we all have clouds. We as a post facility have clouds. Um, as a VFX, and, and, and as we distribute content to a VFX facility or a sound facility, even back to a content owner like Warner Brothers or ABC or Disney, everyone has a cloud. The content owner, even individual companies, have siloed clouds within that company as they distribute back to archive and distribution. And then finally, once we get to digital distribution, we have Amazon, Hulu, Netflix, all these clouds that we're distributing feature films and television to. As, we, as content flows through all these clouds, these security needs are changing, and the financial needs are changing. So we have to have some faith that, that there's going to be a fundamental change in our industry, because in reality, none of these clouds are connected. So, we had to embrace an idea and, and not only look at, at our challenges as a business, but our challenges as the entertainment industry, as a community. So we want to talk about what our future cloud is, because our future cloud isn't our siloed cloud. It's a community martini. So, as we looked for a solution to, to not only embrace cloud, but embrace, embrace cloud from a community perspective, we were looking for something that had open standards. So we could incorporate multiple software vendors. We didn't feel like we needed to accelerate or, or, or push an ideology that was only our own, something that was open. We needed to share metadata through APIs with multiple software entities that were building their own clouds. And we did an easy way to have templating so that people who were not necessarily familiar with standing up their own clouds could share um, a cloud, a common cloud infrastructure. Security 
was very important to us, and it's very important to the entertainment industry as a whole. So we wanted one user identity, this idea of federated identity, so that we could have a single user, a single authenticated user. We would know that user from, from private cloud to public cloud and back to private cloud. And also, the idea that you could migrate that identity so that all these interconnected clouds could, could know who would have permission to a given asset. And we had to have ease of migration. So once we started to talk about private cloud, public cloud, and content flowing between private cloud and public cloud throughout a cycle of production on a television or film, we needed that ease of migration. For us, the key to our business is a file's journey. A file's journey from camera and acquisition through cr the creative process and editorial and manipulating that content into, f into final distribution. So really, it's a file's journey. And that file's journey is important when you start to talk about pub public and private cloud and how that flows from one aspect to the next. And really, in the end, it was deployment, deployment, deployment. We're the entertainment industry. We're not, we're not an industry of smart people like you in the audience. We're, an indus we're simple people with simple needs. And the bottom line is we're creative people. So we needed a way to package deployment in a way that a studio or a content creator could deploy themselves. And really, at the end of the day, what we ended up with was OpenStack as a private cloud and Rackspace as our public cloud. So, and we're sharing content between the two. And an example of that is a little unaired clip from Modern Family. I didn't know what you wanted to drink, so I just got you this soda. Oh, that's fine, thank you. Cam, what did you do? I did exactly what you did, because I know you so well. I didn't shake the soda. Then you have nothing to worry about, so go ahead and open it. I shook it, okay? I shook the soda. I shook it up. Are you happy? It was petty and stupid and awful. I'm sorry. Damn it. So currently, we're running our video streaming software on both a private and public OpenStack. And Modern Family has done that way. We did a feature this year called Her, which also used our software. And really, what this software is, is it's collaboration software. So when we think about cloud, or we go out to a, an individual or a studio and talk about what cloud means to us, cloud means collaboration. It means creative collaboration. And with that, I really want to thank you, the developers. And I owe you all a big hug. Every single one of you who contributes to OpenStack, I owe you all a hug. So you have one free voucher for one hug from me, if you see me in the hallway. So you know, we, we, we are deeply indebted and are gratefully contributing back and encouraging this idea of open source within the entertainment industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillaume. So, um, you know, a lot of people say that hybrid cloud is, uh, is, is just a myth, but you guys are doing it. Absolutely. That's great. That, that clip, I, I didn't recognize that clip. What, what episode is that from? That's from episode, season five, episode six, which has yet to air this year. Wow, okay. So you guys saw, saw it here first, unaired footage from Modern Family. So thank you, Guillaume. And, and thank you, Fox, for letting us use that as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> so our, uh, our third user that we're going to bring up is, a, uh, is, is not in the media business. They are in, uh, in something that, uh, that probably many of us have to deal with on a regular basis as we, uh, as we go about our business. But um, they, uh, they are making use of, uh, of OpenStack storage in some interesting ways. And, uh, and I'm really excited to bring up senior manager for Concur, Dan Wilson. Go 
go get them. Thank you. Really excited to be here today and have the opportunity to share the story about how we brought OpenStack into our environment. Uh, but before I get into that too much, let me tell you a little bit about Concur. Uh, how many folks here today are traveling on business with a show of hands? Thank you, quite a few. And uh, of those, how many of you are excited about the prospect of filling out your expense claim to get reimbursed? Just as I thought, nobody. Nobody likes expense reports, and that's where Concur comes in. We automate expense reports and travel booking to make it easier for the business traveler. And at the same time, we give your businesses much better visibility into that spend so they can control costs before it happens. But don't take my word for it. Here's a short video from one of our customers. Great. Well, you saw in the video there how he was taking a picture of the receipt. Uh, that is a critical part of our uh, uh, system and how it works. In order to get that visibility into the spend, we have to store the receipts in our system. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember what I expensed seven years ago. Well, guess what? We have to at Concur. We have to store that data for seven to 11 years, depending on international tax laws. And that adds up to a lot of images. And what we saw is that with all of that data in our system and the, the growing adoption in mobile, that we needed to make some changes to our environment to scale. One of the areas that we wanted to uh, fix was our storage tier. We were relying on Windows file share technology, and we wanted to bring in an object-based storage system. We ended up choosing Swift, and I'll explain a little bit more about why we chose Swift in a few minutes. But before I do, you know, here's the team at Concur that really made this a reality. Uh, really proud to work with these developers and architects uh, in our company. And this is the solution that we came up with, which gives us a lot more linear processing and the ability to scale every tier of the processing. So why did we pick Swift? Well, uh, first of all, it gives us the ability to choose our own hardware for our data centers to run our storage system, what gives us better cost savings at that tier and gives us the performance that our customers need. Uh, and when we grow that system, all of the data gets spread equally across every node. So our customers have a very consistent performance experience. Another uh, aspect that I love is the visibility into the code. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating to me than when I get an error message, I don't know what it is, I Google it, Google doesn't know what it is, and then I'm left to use enterprise support or customer support, and most of the time, it just leaves us very frustrated and not knowing the cause of an issue and we have to find a way to, to architect around it. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to dig deep into the code and improve uh, the code for the entire community. The last feature, which was really critical to us and we couldn't deploy in our environment without, is global cl clusters. And Jonathan's going to come back up and tell us more about that. Jonathan? Thanks, Dan. Thank you. So we just had our, uh, our 
eighth release of OpenStack, the Havana release, and there were about 400 features in there, but one of the biggest ones was in the object storage system. And this was a, an, an update to how replication and data is managed, not just within a single cluster. You know, um, the object storage system has always had a high level of durability within an OpenStack cluster that's in a region or a data center. But uh, in, in Havana, this was, uh, was, was really improved to where these clusters can now span multiple geographies. So you can have an object storage cluster that has nodes in Portland and nodes in Hong Kong, and the replication is managed across both of those environments so that you get an even higher level of durability. But it goes even farther than that. And we have a little animation here, let's go ahead and play that, that, uh, that demonstrates how this actually trickles down to the, uh, to the individual users. If you have an environment that, that spans multiple clusters, you can, uh, as a user, just go about your normal daily use of your applications and using technologies like geo load balancing and geo DNS be routed automatically to the location in your global Swift cluster that's closest to you. So I upload some data and it gets written to Portland because I'm in the US. The object storage system then automatically replicates that data to the other locations in the global cluster and now we have durable copies in Hong Kong. What's great about it though is now if I am traveling and let's say that I'm in Europe and I wanna pull up uh, something from the internet and we all know that what the internet is good for is silly cat photos, right? <laughs> then uh, GeoDNS is automatically gonna route me to the closest location and pull that data, in this case, Hong Kong. So you end up with a higher level of durability, you end up with better performance for your end users and you can also end up with lower cost for, for performance across this new feature that's, uh, that's actually in, uh, built right into OpenStack object storage now. Thank you. Well, as uh, you heard, it's a pretty incredible feature. I'm really excited about having it in our data centers. What we really like about it is uh, a couple of things. One, it gives us that resiliency across multiple regions for our data. Uh, it's very important that we keep all of our images. Uh, but also, it gives our customers better performance when they're accessing the receipts. Uh, we plan on using this technology in other big business segments at Concur. And uh, I would like to, to give our customers the option to choose which regions their data is stored in. So with that, and uh, uh, thanks to the efforts of the community to bring that, that feature uh, into OpenStack Swift, uh, and also thank you to, to SwiftStack, uh, we're able to now scale our uh, architecture the way it needs to scale over the next uh, year, uh, or several years, I should say, sorry. Um, in fact, I did an analysis over uh, what we're expecting for our scale, and within five years, we'll have over 10 billion images stored in our environment. And now we have an environment that can handle that. Great, thank you, Dan. Thank you. So, um, 10 billion images, and as you were pointing out, you know, your customers are some of the, the biggest companies in the world, and there are rules and regulations around what you have to do with, with all of these artifacts to maintain them, and yet you're using something that's really kind of cutting edge technology from an open source project. How do you get the comfort level in, uh, in, in deploying that kind of technology? Have you been able to find the partners and the support that you need from the community? Yeah, that was huge for us. I mean, we're, we're not experts at this. Uh, we're still learning. And uh, having a strong partner that, that knew it already uh, made a big difference. And really, we had to trust uh, that, that company quite a bit mm -hmm. um, because it is such a critical part of our infrastructure. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that, uh, that um, you know, many of these users that, that we're going to hear from have found partners like SwiftStack and, and others in the, in the um, ecosystem that have helped them to be able to meet those business needs. So thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. That was an interesting range of, uh, of use cases with, um, you know, large-scale compute services, large-scale storage services, hybrid cloud across a number of, uh, of different industries. And as we go through this week, there's going to be a lot more content that, uh, that's delivered out there. We, uh, we just heard from these users how OpenStack is having an impact in their business every day. And we're gonna hear that from dozens of other users. 
And tomorrow, Mark Collier, the CEO of the OpenStack Foundation, is going to be kicking off the keynotes in the morning with a, uh, with a session um, that spotlights some, uh, some outstanding users from China specifically. And so come back tomorrow because that one's going to be very interesting. But you know, if, if uh, managing large-scale data, if uh, running application infrastructure, or, or doing software development is strategic for your business, then OpenStack is a platform that, that can have an impact uh, for your business as well. And, and we are seeing that over and over and over again. And at this event, at these summits, we come to learn, we come to meet and to spend time with the community, but we also come to plan the future. And I just want to leave with, with a couple of thoughts on, uh, on that, on the future. Because there's a lot of talk about the future and about what OpenStack is going to become, what is it going to be. And in a lot of those discussions, they're filled with industry jargon. You know, you, you see a lot of terms that, uh, that get thrown around, a lot of acronyms. <laughs> and ultimately, I think that the terms are the least important part. What really matters is that we are engaging users and we're solving their problems, we're meeting their needs, and we're building software that lets them go out and do the things they need to do in their business. And if we think back to the mission that, uh, that OpenStack laid out years ago, it's to produce the ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform to meet the needs of public and private clouds regardless of size. And, and that is a, that's a very broad mission, it's a very big mission. But we are actually doing that. And that's really incredible. That's what this community has been able to, to do over the past three years. And you know, there are going to be debates about all kinds of things. You can look at any, any large community, whether it's Android or iOS or Linux, whatever it is, um, there are always debates about where they begin, where they end, what category they fit into. Um, every ambitious project is going to have those debates, and it's going to evolve over time. But I think that as long as we can focus in on users and on their needs, on creating a platform and an ecosystem, then OpenStack is going to continue to grow and to have a lot of success. Because users, you know, they don't obsess about SaaS and PaaS and IaaS and those kinds of things. They obsess about solving their problems. And right now, they're doing that through a combination of OpenStack software, of added services on top of that, of tools that they build, tools that the ecosystem builds. And so what we are seeing is that the community and the process that we have in place in OpenStack is really doing amazing things for our users out there. Because OpenStack is a place where individuals can come and have an impact, and that is why OpenStack is having an impact. Anything that has an impact in this world, ultimately it comes down to the individuals who are taking part in that, driving it forward, and making it happen. And this community has developed an amazing system for enabling people to do that. So this week, we're going to have thousands of people from 50 countries who are going to be here building the software that's powering hundreds of clouds, doing millions of dollars of business, and it's all going to be happening right here in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. And that, to me, is, is extremely exciting. So I think that, um, you know, just in closing, what we, what we are seeing is the power of open communities, open source, open platforms, and open systems. Um, Mr. Daniel Lai, who is the government CIO for Hong Kong that, uh, that introduced us this morning, you might have noticed that he, uh, he had his notes on a, on a Nexus 7. And we met him last night at, at an event, a community event, and you know, walked up and shook his hands. And he was really excited. And he reached into his suit jacket pocket and pulled out his Nexus 7, <laughs> and, which I was like, how does your suit jacket have a pocket that big? <laughs> But, uh, but he, he was very excited because he's, he's on an open system now. And he talked about how important open systems are from a government perspective, from an innovation perspective. You know, they, they want to encourage startups and, uh, and businesses to thrive in Hong Kong. And they want to encourage open systems um, as, a, as an enabler for all of that. And, and that's what we see across these open systems. You think about Linux and Android. Those are technologies that, knowingly or not, we interact with every single day. And more and more, OpenStack is becoming a technology like that. It touches our lives almost every day, whether you're doing a transaction on PayPal, whether you're watching a network television show, 
whether you're filling out your expense report. And right now, this week, Hong Kong, the OpenStack Summit, is the center of it all. So you are in the right place at the right time. So thank you for being here. We're all very excited to have you join us this week as part of the OpenStack community.